Hey guys, welcome back to the home shop. So we are setting up to begin our last machining phase for a hard till vise. And that is gonna be working on the internal shape on the main vise body right there. And we're gonna be doing that right over here on our good old school G&E shaper, all right? So I was hoping that I was gonna have this done before now, but the way that everything just kind of fell in line is that this ended up becoming sort of one of the last things that I had to do for the vise. But let me give you a quick rundown of what we have to do and how I plan on setting this guy up. All right, so this is our piece that we're gonna be working on. The main vice body is what I call it. And we need to get the inside of this machine so that it precisely fits our dynamic jaw body right there. You have the chin portion right here that's gotta be cut. And on the inside, you just have, you have the two sides right there. On the top there, you have sort of an L-shaped part that's that was uh, put into the, the pattern that's got to be cut. And if we come around here to the back side, I think you guys might be able to see that a little bit better right there. I think further at this end, you can see the top corners that I'm talking about, that L shape. You got one right here and right here. This bottom surface is going to match the chin out here. All right, and that's gonna be for our uh, vice draw to slide across. And then we have our side to side that we wanna cut in. Hopefully nice and uh, close fit on this guy right here. The tolerance that I'm going for on this is gonna be five thousandths or less. I'm gonna try to shoot somewhere between that three and five thousandths range. And I think that'll be a pretty good tolerance on allowing this to slide through there. And that's one of the things that Fireball Tools did whenever they uh, designed this vise. Jason, he wanted to have a nice, close fitting vise. Most of your older ones, you know, whenever you grab the, the dynamic jaw, it moves around. Here we'll use this reed here as an example. Usually you have quite a bit of side to side movement on these dynamic jaws because they had a looser tolerance inside there. So we want to try to tighten it up and make a nice precision fit, a precision sliding fit on our jaw. Okay, so that's what we're going to be shooting for there. As far as how we're going to be getting that done, this is an extra clapper box that I, that I have that was given to me uh, back whenever we were refurbishing the, uh, the G&E here. There was someone that found the same shaper in a scrap yard and they pulled a few of the parts off of it and sent it to me, the clapper box being one of those. So I modified it. I machined two different internal bars that we can use for doing internal shapes. I machined the hex nuts and whenever we're gonna be using this, I'll take this clapper box off and then bolt this one on and then use that. I'm gonna take this bar out and we're gonna be using this other bar I made, this is a longer one, because it will actually reach all the way through here from the back side. Get that guy in there and show you. So we gotta start on this face and we gotta cut all the way to right there. Now it will not reach uh, all the way through and cut this chin portion here. So we're gonna have to do this one separately. And I plan on actually getting this one machined first because that is the dimension that I have on my print is from the bottom surface of this to right here, I have a dimension to reach. And so once I get this side cut, then we can rotate it around 180 and come in from the back side, and I'll, have, I'll be able to match this area down here to what we cut the chin at. And then just as far as going side to side there as well. So that's how I plan on getting the inside of it cut. As far as holding it, what I'm gonna be doing is removing the big vise right here. And this is a fixture plate that I made a while back to work on another job. I've already got it drilled and counterboard so that we can bolt it directly up to the shaper table there. And what that allows me to have is a much larger work area there that you can put work pieces on. So I'm gonna get that mounted up. We're gonna get the vise bolted together to the swivel plate, get it set on here. I need to kind of see where our bar is gonna be because I wanna get it positioned back here so that I have plenty of room for my bar to be able to go all the way through this workpiece. That's one of the disadvantages of the size of the shaper table that they put on the G&E. And I don't know why they didn't make a longer table for something that's got a 32 inch stroke. You have, I think it was an 18 inch table on that. So having that fixture is gonna allow me to put some of the larger work pieces on there. And that's exactly why I have this guy right here. We just kind of machine it as need. So we're gonna begin getting all this set up and I'm gonna bring you along for this project. Okay, I've got the fixture mounted up to the shaper table there 
and I've got it positioned in a good spot, I believe. I've done some measuring. You can see we've got our bar, and this is kind of in line where it's going to be mounted up there on the clapper. And my goal was to not to have to retract this way up into the machine. Typically, that's what you got to do is uh, change your <clears throat> RAM position and, and have it retract way inside there, which I didn't want to have to do. That way, where we're, where we're going to be positioned here, it doesn't have to go too much further inside the, uh, the, the main body here before it has to come back. So I actually already have layout lines on this fixture from when I laid it out the first time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to line up these holes with this layout line here. And then I've already got it one in the center. So it'll be really simple to just lay this out by hand. So since I got it where I think it needs to be, I'm going to go ahead and take all this back off. We're going to move this over to that big table. And we're going to use the mag drill to drill the hole and the flex arm to tap them. Okay, we've got our fixture laid out now. I still need to uh, punch them. I'm going to get the optical center punch over here for that. But we have our 12 inch that way. And then we got eight inch that way, just working right off of our existing uh, layout line that I already had on there. So we'll get out our Tom Taylor optical center punch. We'll go ahead and punch them. And then, so I'm gonna use dad's Bucks mag drill right here to drill the hole. And we're gonna use the flex arm to tap it. So I was gonna point out, I don't wanna go all the way through there. It's inch and a half thick. We don't need to go that far. I'm just gonna take it down about an inch and a quarter. So we'll use a, a 5 16 pilot drill to pilot it. And then our tap size of 17 32nd. And then I'll chamfer the top of it. And then after we get them all drilled, we'll be able to quickly tap it with the flex arm. So we're gonna use our optical center punch to punch these. It's been a little while since I've shown this. I even had some guys mention this a while back that we need to see it again. Mr. Tom Taylor's the one to give me this. And it is a very neat little tool to have. Very simple in operation. So in case you guys haven't seen one of these before, it's just a piece of aluminum and a couple holes drilled in it. One of them is an optical sight that you look down and on the back side of that, you can't see it on camera, but there's actually a, a dot in the center of that with a circle and crosshairs. And all you do is just stick that in there to line up your hatch mark there that you scribed in. And once you visually see that dot in the very center of your uh, crosshairs, you take that guy out, hold it down, try not to move it. The other guy is your punch, it's your center punch. You drop that in there, try not to move it, and then you just tap it with the hammer and that gets your mark there. And this, this puts your mark on. So after that, if you need a little bit deeper punch mark, then you get, use a center punch to do that. So let's go ahead and see if we can get this guy go. And I'm just gonna leave that one out. It's just uh, less prone when you're using it. If you get in a hurry and you're not careful, when you go to pull that out, you can definitely move it. So I'm just gonna leave it out. And let's see if I can get this guy lined up here. A little bit easier if you start like that. That way you can kind of visually see the, the crosshairs down in there. And you got to get down here on it. Yep. This is about a pretty good distance. You have a focal point you got to find. And there's a little tiny black dot. And I've got it right in the center of that X. So... Bring my punch right there. I'm gonna move my optical center out of the way. And drop that in right there. Just give it a little tap -a -roo, Just like that. And then we're dead in the center of those cross marks right there. And as I said, after you get your little mark punched in there, then you come in there with a standard center punch and punch it a little bit deeper. It's good enough. We'll move on to the other three now.
such a nice way to get your center punch mark dead center of that cross mark. I think we already punched that one. All right, one more to go. All right, we'll start off with a uh, center point right there just to line up the uh, punch mark. Mag it down. Sometimes you got to redo it. Like there, I didn't really like the way that one. You have a little bit of slack in this guy. You know, it's not perfect, but for most of the stuff that you're doing, especially field work or... Uh, doing plate steel like this or structural steel, really hard to be beat. All right, that feels better. All right, and then we're going to use our 5 16 pilot. I got some white paint marks on there to mark my uh, depth there, which is going to be a little, little more than an inch deep. All right, and then for cutting fluid, I'm going to use my CRC cutting oil, foaming cutting oil. And I like to use my hearing plugs because this motor is kind of loud and my ears just don't like loud, high-pitched noises. about as deep as I can go where it's at. So I actually need to bring that drill down just a little bit further. Going with our 17 30 second, just verifying that I grabbed the right one. Anytime you pull one of these drills out, always verify that you got the right size because learn from my mistakes. When you assume it's the right drill, that's when you drill the wrong size hole. Got a chant for tool right here. We'll go ahead and chant for the hole. Make sure that'll go down there. It should. Okay. Do that three more times. Unlock the mag. And I like to take my brush and sweep these chips off out of the way every time.
right, we got all four of our holes drilled, chamfered, and we're going to be going with our 5 8 11 tap. One thing I was going to point out is that I still don't have all of the correct series taps that I, that I need for the flex arm. Once you get these guys in there, let me see if I can pull that one out. Once you get them in there, the ones that I have, it really kind of sticks up in there quite a ways. Oh, come on, just come out of there. There we go. So there's our 5 8 tap. Now this is a, a good tap for most cases when you're doing this on the machine. Maybe you got it in a collet and you're doing some power tapping. But when you go into these flex arm holders right here and you stick it in there and it lines up with the square, you can see just how much. So that's gonna be really close to our tapping depth, not quite up to the tap holder, but that's pretty close to our tapping depth there. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. It's gonna look like it's a little short, but it will work. So we are ready to power tap now. All right, all of our drilling and tapping worked out pretty good. All of our holes are lined up. These are the, the closest bolts that I have and that I, I wanna put a washer on there. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and I've got some 5 8 all thread. I'm gonna go ahead and cut some studs. That way I can use a good washer and we'll use a flange done on that to hold that guy down. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the fixture plate transplanted back over onto the shaper and get this all mounted up. And I'm gonna bring you guys back when we're uh, getting this guy indicated and ready to make our first cuts. Okay, we've got our plate mounted back to the shaper table here. We'll go ahead and get our studs in, start getting this thing mounted together. like it was made for it. Now, I'm sure some of you are concerned with us using a hot rolled flat plate here for our fixture. It is good enough for what we're doing here. It's flat enough. It's not gonna cause any problems there. Does it need to be machined? Sure it does. It's something that I would like to get on our big flex CNC and get both sides milled, maybe even machine some kind of hole pattern in here to make it a uh, more of a universal fixture plate with holes already tapped in there. But I feel confident that this is plenty flat enough for the job that we're doing right here with machining this, this vise. We'll even, we'll even scoot an indicator across here to uh, see what kind of flatness that we have on this surface here. But the plate is nice and flat. The table is as flat as it can be because we mounted it to the flat side, not the universal side. I already swept it this way and I was within a half a thousandth from one side of the plate to the other. So we know we're good in that direction. All right, so we'll move on. Probably go ahead and start getting this clapper box swapped out next. I actually got ahead of myself 
and I mounted this on here, but I actually need to get the vice body mounted on here and get our swivel bolt mounted in there too, because I do want to be able to uh, pivot this when we're doing our machining and I need to be able to get to the bottom side to, uh, to be able to get the swivel bolt in there. So I'm just going to redo this and I'll bring you guys back when we have it, when we have it bolted down on here properly. Let's go ahead and check our flatness before we take it back off there. Looks like about one and a half thousandths is what I'm reading right there. Go ahead and sweep it one more time. It's just under the zero line. I'd call that one and a half thousandths or less. So I'm good with that. We're gonna leave it. We're not gonna be concerned about where this is mounted on the plate and the plate not being perfectly flat. This is gonna be perfectly suitable for the job at hand here. We'll give it a sweep across this axis as well. Negative two right there. Oh, gotta go the other way. A little high in the middle there. Probably the way that it's being pulled down to a non-machine plate. That's about negative two and a half right there. So I feel pretty good. I think that bow that it's got in it that you're seeing is actually from it being pulled down on this non-machine surface. But again, I'm real happy with that. It's gonna work out just fine. So we are gonna, we are gonna roll with it. Always something, isn't it? So that, <laughs> the studs are just a little bit too tall to be able to pivot that all the way around. Oh man, what do they say? If it's not one thing, it's another, right? It looks like it's gonna, it'll just clear all of the flange nuts. So I need to take I need to take all these studs down to the height of the flange nuts there so that we can pivot this around because what I was planning on doing was we're going to cut this side first because remember my bar will not go from this side to this side if we want to cut that bottom plane all the way across. I want to cut this side first, get it to the right height, and then we were going to pivot it around 180 degrees, get it indicated, and then go from this face to this corner right there cutting the inside of the body. All right, so I'll modify these studs and get this ready so that we know we can pivot it around when we need to rotate it.
All right, looks like that'll work. Got to do that three more times. Okay, this was the last stud to uh, face off. So we took anywhere from a quarter inch to three eighths off of them. I just measured them with a scale here because I, I didn't go to the same depth on every single hole. All right, full rotation now, okay. Got that tackled. We'll go ahead and now we can go ahead and move on to getting our clapper box swapped out to the other style. So the reason why I was thinking I'd go ahead and swap it out to the bar is uh, doing this cut right here. This is our traditional tool that we usually use and, and it will clear, you can see, but you see how far down you have to go and we can take this jaw off out of the way, but the lantern right here in the nut, I think is gonna be right there in line with the top of the vise. So we're gonna have to stick this way down here in order to be able to hold it in the lantern to do the cuts. Now that probably will work just fine. I'm, I'm probably gonna go ahead and set it up just to mock it up and see how far this is sticking down if we wanted to use this tool right there. Now you could also turn it 90 degrees this way and cut it this way if you want to but I really wanted to keep the cut pattern uh, in line with the direction of the, the dynamic jaw. So I think I'd rather position it that way and be able to cut it like that. So I know that our internal bar will come in here and do this and we don't have to worry about this lantern coming in here and uh, being in the way of the vice body. So let me do a mock up and just see how this looks using our Armstrong tool holder. I've got our Armstrong tool and a tool bit that I would use mocked up here actually in position where we could do a cut, but you can see what I'm talking about. You got a lot of stick out right here, and I think it'll probably be fine. We'll probably go ahead and, and uh, go forward with this setup here, uh, getting this cut. It'll be a good test for all of us there to kind of see how this reacts. We've already made you know a few cuts with this kind of long stick out, and it does just fine. You just can't take any uh, super heavy cuts or you're gonna get you know deflection and chatter in your cut there. But for taking off what we're gonna be doing to clean this cast iron up, I think this is gonna be perfectly suitable. But you have to keep all of your clearances in mind. So look up here on the lantern body, the top of the jaw. We actually have to touch the tool off, you know, and feed it down. So we gotta have, make sure we have clearance so that we don't hit this as we feed down. But I'll go ahead and run it through the motion so you guys can see here. I think I've got everything set where it should be if we're gonna make this cut. But that right there at the top of the lantern was my main concern in addition to the long stick out of the tool. But I think we're gonna be good. I think we should go ahead and go forward with that and go ahead and get this chin machine, get it flat. We'll use a height gauge here. I've gotta do some measurements on our thickness. There's a measurement on the print that goes from the bottom, the bottom of the main body to this surface, so we'll have to add the thickness of the base. I think it was 0.880 is what we machined that to. And then we can just do a simple measurement there on, uh, on the height. So I think we may go forward with this and go ahead and try to get, go ahead and start getting the chin cut in this position here. All right, last step before we start cutting, I need to go ahead and get this trammed in. I could probably eyeball this, which I've done, and it's gonna be close enough, but let's go ahead and make it right and get that trammed. other way.
too far. Looks like about three or four thousandths still. Come on, I'm trying to get the handle in the cross feed here. Feed it in by hand. There we go. Not too bad, only a couple thou. I'm sure it bothers you like it bothers me to see that, that needle move a little bit. Oh, that looks pretty good right there. I think we hit it. I'm gonna go ahead and lock it down. So we're using our, the, uh, the factory clamps here. <clears throat> One more sweep and see if it moved on us. About a thousandths, but you know, that's gonna be good enough where we're at. Okay, before we start, let's take a simple measurement on here to see how much material we got to remove. We're gonna use our digital height gauge for this right here. And I'm aware that our fixture plate is not a truly machined surface, but I feel confident that it is completely flat enough for the work that we're doing here on this cast iron vice body, okay? So we're gonna just get a measurement in here and see what it's at. That's 4.462, 4.465 there and about. We'll come over here and check this side. 455, so that was a little, this side's a little bit lower over there, 450. So our highest point is somewhere right about in there, 4.465. I think you guys can, can see that. Okay, so our, our measurement, our target measurement that we want according to our blueprints from this surface up to this surface right here is gonna be 4.350. That's our target size that we wanna hit. So 4.465 minus 4.350, our target leaves us 115,000. So we have just under one eighth of an inch that we got to take off that. So we'll probably do that in two or three cuts to get that across there uh, or to get that cut down, I mean. And as I had mentioned in the previous setup video, you know, we have quite a bit of uh, stick out on our tool right there. We have our tool sticking out there, but this is still gonna work fine. We're not taking any super heavy cuts or high feed rates. So having a tool set up like this should work perfectly fine for taking an eighth of an inch off of this surface right there and getting that cleaned up. And once we get this side done right here, we'll go ahead and remove this tool, remove the clapper, the clapper box and replace it for the one that has the internal shaping bar that we're gonna use for the inside. All right, so we have our measurement. Let's go ahead, let's make some chips. I'm gonna get a touch off established here. All right, there we go, there's a touch. Always get the tool lined up as close to the cut as we can. All right, there we go. All right, we got a zero set. Since we've got 115 to take off, I think what we'll do is a 50, 50, and then the final about 15. So should be three cuts. All right, that's 50 thou there. I always take it and just try to remove the backlash. There's usually about four divisions of backlash in this. Right there, it felt about three and a half, and that's so that it doesn't, they're in the middle of the cut, it doesn't pull the tool or pull the tool head down into the backlash, causing it to cut deeper. All right, so let's get to cutting now. Feed, feed and gaze, there we go.
right, well, we definitely had, I'm gonna stop this right here. We definitely had a little bit of chatter in that cut, and that's what I was expecting with the tool hanging down this far. That was a 20,000 step over two, I believe. Yep, 20,000. So once we get to our finished cut, that'll be, we'll, we'll be able to take a few thou off there and make a nice finish. All right, let's go ahead and crank this over by hand and get started on the next side here. Point four oh seven, four oh seven, four oh seven looks nice and flat. Four point four zero seven minus four point three fifty is fifty seven thousandths to come off that. So this will be a 25 thou cut. Let's see how that does. It's safer to crank it by hand, get it up close to the edge, and then re-engage it and re-engage the feed. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and just get another measured off camera here and see where we're at. All right, this is gonna be a 10,000th depth of cut with a 10,000th step over. This will be kind of like a test to see how our finish will look with using this tool right here. That looks pretty good. I think that's gonna be perfectly suitable to make our finished pass across there.
368. Remember, 350 is going to be our finish. 368, nice and straight. So I'm going to take a 10 thousandths pass. We'll remeasure it, and then the last should be around seven to eight thousandths, probably. Okay, this should be our last measurement, last cut. Should be about seven or eight thousandths. Seven and a half. Eight. Eight thousandths, fifty-eight. Fifty-eight. I'm gonna call it at fifty-eight thousandths. Looks good to me. Let's dial in eight thousandths. I have to be really careful on this uh, the the division collar up on the top because every line is two thousandths. So we're actually gonna be moving it four lines or four divisions to get to our final cut depth there. Got a dial indicator set up to see if I can get eight thousandths. We're lined up on our 100 mark here. I don't mean to block you. Let's see. Four, six, eight. All right, so we're at five, six, seven. It looks like I took seven thousandths. It's actually a little past seven. That's probably good enough, but let's go ahead and just, just tap it. Didn't really move it. About seven and a half, so I'm gonna leave it right there and let's make our finish cut. All right, finish pass, here we go. I'm excited to see how we finished here, if we landed on our target size. Hopefully we did. There's no going back, really. All right, let's get our height gauge over here and measure it.
349, looks like I overshot it by about a thousandth, right? Check this side. That says 350. Did I push it down too hard? Or is it just the, the fixture plate messing with us? 349 and a half. Go back and check this side again. 349. So I would say that we hit it within one thousandths of our target. That says 350 right there. So we definitely got a little bit of movement in our, uh, our work surface that we're measuring off of. But we're measuring within a thousandth of an inch of what our target is. So I would call that pretty good. That was our highest measurement right there. 49 and a half. I think I rolled it up on a chip there on that last one. All right, well that makes me happy. That is our target right there. So we did good on this guy. It is time to get this side cleaned up and rotate it 180 degrees. One of the areas that I had uh, failed to mention to you during this operation was in between uh, these landings on the chin. So I've got an adjustable parallel in there and got a measurement on it. All right, and it's right around two inches, two inches 51, okay? There and about, changes a thou or two, depending on where you're measuring it at. So that step in the bottom of the dynamic jaw is what's gonna slide through there. But we've actually already got clearance where it's at right now. If we come over here and measure that, you can see that we're getting two inch 47. So I think that that is already gonna slide through there where it's at, and we shouldn't have to do any more cutting. I took a file I took a file and ran down each side of it just to kind of clean up the, the raw casting there and I went ahead and deburred and everything. So I think it's gonna fit through there, but that's also gonna determine if we're centered, if we get these areas all the way through there centered where that is cast. So I'm gonna leave it alone for now. And if we have some kind of alignment fitment, fitment issues, then we can come back in here with a tool and just kind of just skin the inside of that just to kind of clean it up and, and give us some additional clearance if we need that. And the same thing on the back here, but the back section here is actually already wider than that. So yeah, it's already two inch 90. So I think the back is, this area right here is plenty clearance for that jaw to slide down through there. But we're gonna be relying on this bottom surface that's equal to the chin and then side to side to keep everything centered up. Same thing up here on the top there as well.